Hello and welcome to the Smart Women in Business vlog and podcast. Today I am talking to Karen Hollenbach. Karen is an independent LinkedIn specialist trainer and the founding director of Think Bespoke. With over 10 years LinkedIn training and LinkedIn profile writing experience in Australia, Karen was rated as a Asia Pacific's top 10 LinkedIn experts in 2019, which is amazing. Karen works with smart women who want to get better clients on LinkedIn. Karen offers a LinkedIn marketing mentor program, virtual consultants, a good consult and on-demand training for game changers and subject matter experts wishing to improve their LinkedIn presence. Yay! Welcome, Karen. Thank you. And can I put you on the spot and get you to describe what you called LinkedIn? <laughs> <laughs> I said off air, I'm not going to say that on the podcast. I call it the middle aged white man of social. Because it's never not the that. pretty young millennial like Instagram and it's not <laughs> the 40 year old woman like Facebook. <laughs> but Karen's working hard that. to change the face of LinkedIn. Yes, I love that because one of the first questions, so thank you so much for having me. One of the You're first welcome. questions I ask people when I run training is if you were to describe. LinkedIn as a colleague or a friend, how would you describe them? And no one's ever said that, but they have said, oh, it's the friend that if I saw in the street, I'd cross the road and not oh, say hello. <laughs> that's so hurtful to LinkedIn. <laughs> Poor little LinkedIn. I, um, oh dear. I have developed a bit more of a love for LinkedIn lately. I, I sort of did a bit of an outreach. I, I optimised my um, profile and it's mm. been fun. It's been yeah, fun. Yeah, it can be. It's not sort of... Saturday night fun, but it's, you know, Tuesday morning fun. It's sort of, I say it's like the salad. It's the green salad that, you know, you want to order the Parma, but you order the salad or the Buddha bowl because you know it's good for you, right? It's good, good for your health, good for your business. And so it's kind of like you feel good afterwards, but you'd, pr you'd probably prefer to be elsewhere <laughs> or eating something else. Eating a bowl of chips. But, yeah. Um, yeah. but LinkedIn is so incredible because everyone's on there for business. Mm. it's not dilute mm. like Instagram and Pinterest and Facebook. It is so focused and such an yeah. opportunity. Yeah. So anyway, before we get into the, the merits, right, of yes. how much we love our favorite middle-aged white man colleague, <laughs> uh, tell me about your business journey and how you got to where you are now. Cause obviously LinkedIn hasn't been around forever. No, well, turns 18 this year, I think. So how oh, did I begin? Be mother. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm a corporate escapee. So I, you know, did my Bachelor of Business Marketing, followed my career trajectory, worked in a trade marketing and then a senior strategic marketing role for about 11 years. So that was for a fabulous global organisation called Diageo Australia. When I joined, it was United Distillers. Then it became Guinness UDV. Then it became Diageo. So you can guess our brands. So I was a rep out on the road when we launched a Lichnea Lemon Rusky on St. Ooh, Patrick's geez, Day. I, I single-handedly supported that <laughs> launch, I reckon. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we all have many memories of that. And that was a really interesting brand for lots of reasons because it was not about the consumer. It was about breaking the, really challenging the, the laws around how alcohol is taxed. So that was a really interesting time to be working in, in consumer-based marketing. It was great. It was where I sort of built all my, I guess, my my hustling skills, I'd have to say, that served me really well when I launched into entrepreneurial land. Anyway, life went on and traveling to uh, Sydney every single week, I was based out of Melbourne, got a little bit tiring. I had my mm. first child while I was still working for Diageo, went out on mat leave, came back. And well, it was while I was on maternity leave with my second child, I've got two boys who are now Congrats. 15 and 13. Oh, they're big two. boys. Yeah, they're big boys. One's a lot taller, you know, a lot taller than me. Uh, and so I chose an executive outplacement. And at that point, um, I think I had two really young children, um, I think under two, I have, you know, a three month old baby or a five, maybe a nine month old baby. And I was introduced to LinkedIn as a place at the time. So this is, you know, 2008, that was, you know, you need to be on here when you're making your next career move. And then as I really thought about how I wanted to show up in, for work, I love working. Yeah, me too. I really, yeah, I really enjoy, I, I loved my job and, and I, I guess this sort of BS was fed to me that you can have it all. And I realised after my first child, you can't. Well, not and if I, you want to keep your um, 
sanity intact. Absolutely. If you want to keep your sanity, if you want to maintain a great relationship with your husband or your partner or however, you know, you choose to create a family. And so for me, it was sort of saying, all right, well, how am I, how am I going to do this? You know, how am I going to do two children? And, and then at the same time, as I was sort of working through this, my mum was diagnosed with dementia. Oh. So specifically Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. So I'm kind of like, oh, hello. I need to find something where I'm working remote, working remotely. It's really familiar for all of us now, isn't it? Yeah, it the was, time it wasn't. It was alien. Yeah, you, you know, you, when I took calls for my business, I was locking myself in the toilet so people couldn't hear my children, I, you know, like all the things. And now it's all very acceptable to have your yeah, kids calling in when it's you're on so... an international news network. Yeah. <laughs> it's, so... <laughs> it's so much better. But in those early days, I really couldn't quite get my head. And, you know, Instagram, all those sort of things, but LinkedIn was there. And so what I did was I started a business called Bespoke Professional Resumes. I couldn't get, uh, I couldn't register. Um, there's something I wanted. I wanted bespoke, but I wanted the bespoke too. Brothers. I wanted bespoke communications, and it was yeah. Crazy. So, but you know who has that? Uh, Peter Costello got that registered that across the country. So I couldn't get it. So I was bespoke professional resumes for a while. Did that. Was also doing LinkedIn profile writing, and then because I've got this, um, I worked in strategic comms roles at t- sort of towards the end. Strategic marketing at LinkedIn, and uh, sorry, at LinkedIn at DHG. Yeah, yeah. She Karen <laughs> used to work for LinkedIn. Never worked for LinkedIn, independent LinkedIn consultant, managed a team, all that kind of stuff. And so I really started to think about how I was going to show up in my business when I was looking after two young children, the care of my mother was starting to sort of ramp up and it needed, I needed to network, right? I needed to stay connected to my professional community. So I started to really leverage my network. So all the sort of guys that I'd worked with and predominantly men, but you know, a few lovely women too, and the men were lovely. They were kind of going across Asia Pacific and getting to more senior roles. So they were talking to me about LinkedIn profiles and, and their resumes. And so that kind of built through my network. I got a lot of my business for my first three to five years, or probably first three years through my, those professional networks. And then as my children got older and, the care of my mother really started to be more manageable. It changes if you've got a parent with dementia. It's, it's a really long, difficult journey. My mother is no longer with me. She oh, passed so away sorry. in December 2019. Um, and so as my business kind of, as my mother's health deteriorated, my business sort of grew because I was forcing myself to sort of show up in ways that allowed me to participate in all areas of my life but so I was leveraging LinkedIn as a tool more and more and I really started to use it to raise the profile of my business and so what was happening is a lot of people in my community were saying to me can you do for us what you're doing for Think Bespoke and I have a head of online content solutions who works with me Debbie Hatswell who's also a corporate escapee so she and I developed this very unique method that we still use with clients that we manage on an ongoing basis and so once we sort of got big girl about it, I like to say, um, you know, we, we sort of put our suit jackets on and I registered, I made uh, Think Bespoke a uh, company in 2015. Um, I trademarked Think Bespoke as a brand and really got serious about becoming the boutique special, you know, educational training consultants specialists in LinkedIn. And I think it was, it's um, 11 years. I've been in business this year. Last year, we celebrated our 10th uh, anniversary and the business has morphed. So what started as the really working in the career space, and we still do support people in the career space, absolutely, but I have a job search and career coach. We're now really in that very specific LinkedIn training space. And I got that acknowledgement, which was lovely of that sort of global expertise. Really yeah, though, I think when you've been, and I, I appreciate my peers acknowledging me, really when you've been in business 10 to 11 years, what happens is, you just get this really lovely bank of referring clients or people who read you regularly that are actively referring you. So even though I rely on my online profile, I'd have to say it's my time in business that's really helped me build my business. And, you know, two of the most exciting clients I've worked with recently are Grattan Institute and I'm working with the State Library of Victoria. And that's just thrilling for me. Oh, exactly right. I NGV. It, I know. The State Library is absolutely my happy place. And that just came out of working with someone at General Assembly who moved across to the State Library. And I also do some work now with the Indigenous Literacy Foundation. Um, I care really deeply about um, the work that they do. And so 
where I'm at now in my journey is really being sort of handpicking the clients that I work with and then also really being very proactive with the network I've built up. So I'm a really big supporter of other women in business. I actually have to say other parents in business and I do acknowledge fur babies as falling into that category. I know if you have a dog that you don't have a child, they're just as important. Um, and really trying to provide, you know, if someone says, who do you know who does X, Y, Z? Mm. I, have a, I really enjoy that sort of proactive recommendation of people um, supporting other people's businesses too. So it's a nice time to be in business and running your own business as an entrepreneur, I feel. But it's um, COVID sort of opened, you could sort of open the cloak behind, you know, yes, I have a home office. Yes, yeah. I've had a home office for 10 years. Yes, all of my team are freelancers. Yes, we're all corporate escapees. Yes, we're all trying to participate in our lives outside of work. And that's mm. okay. And, and you don't actually need an, a, a, a landline anymore. People mm. are like, oh, why? I'm only calling you on your mobile. It's because I only have a mobile. Yeah. And that used to be a, a sticking point for people. They'd get 1300 numbers or they'd get city addresses. Yes. You know, sweet 5,971. And it's like now it's really acknowledged that you can completely run a legitimate multi-million dollar business from home. Absolutely. And I still do have the virtual HQ number, mainly because I got my mobile phone SIM. Someone tried to um, pretend to be me online. So I had to kind of remove my mobile from the public <laughs> consumption. <laughs> Not wow. because it was for clients. It was because someone tried to, I think it's like scam your SIM or something. Oh, haven't heard of that one. That sounds completely dodged. You don't but, want it to happen. That's no. all I can say. Oh, my gosh. Um, so, obviously, your business has gone through an evolution. What would, and, and I think it's part of that for, for us people who are parenting and running a business. That, for me, especially came when my kids started school full-time, mm. which was meant to be last year, but I got to homeschool with oh, instead. How I just, my heart went out to parents of... I heard in one of your interviews and you were just talking about how, how that went. And yeah, that, that was really like, tricky, right? For all of you, from a mental health perspective. And I think from the children's development, it's so hard. Oh, and, and they need their peers. Like, yeah, yeah learning's a social, I'm a trained teacher. Learning is a social process. Yes. <laughs> I know yes. people homeschool and I get it. And you've got all your reasons for doing that. And that's great. And if you can find a social environment where your children can learn with their peers, that's probably great too. Yeah. I was not designed for full-time parenting no. either. No. At all. That's not who, that's not my identity. Anyway, kudos to the ladies and men who are, but it's just not me. And I'm owning that truth. Um, yeah. So what were the signs for you? Obviously, LinkedIn and social and digital marketing's evolved. I've been in business 12 years. It's, it's evolved so much over the last decade. So what were the signs for you that it was time to change your business, your business model, how you work yeah. with your clients? So a lot of it was client led. So we would, you know, you can have a business plan and a marketing plan. And I do, I refresh my marketing plan every year. And at the start of my business, it was really a lot of sort of networking and selling. So that kind of, um, really making sure you were getting into the right conversations. And then as you got regular, as we got regular clients, what I started to realize was that my time was best spent partnering my existing clients and going deeper into their businesses. Mm. So what changed for us was really expanding our services once we knew the clients really well. So while LinkedIn is how a lot of my conversations start. So LinkedIn profile updates, LinkedIn audits, creation of LinkedIn company page, LinkedIn training, LinkedIn guest speaking. That's sort of the, the key, I call them my appetizers, the key things people consume when they think of me. Once I got to know businesses, we would also start to partner with them on, you know, we'd bring in a web developer, we'd help them with their copy. This, this is not our subject matter expertise and I'm not suggesting it is for people sort of tuning in, but we're partnering with clients. Um, we do blog writing, we'd help them with email marketing, we'd uh, prep them for when they'd speak or go into events or and so that became lovely that was sort of the key thing that we did with some of our core clients which really helped me build my business and it meant that we had retainer clients on mm. an ongoing basis I also did a lot of so that was sort of client-led so the first answer is client-led I think we also had a couple of train smashes so we had a few clients that we 
got asked to do certain things and they're in a particular industry or they're a type of client that Debbie and I regularly have this conversation. They're not our ideal client. They're yeah. not our ideal client. They're not, this is not who we should be working with. And so there was a lot of sort of trimming of the branches of the tree. I think Bespoke has a tree in our logo and we would really start to, so I had to go in, I really had to go into conversations with a couple of clients. So we're actually not going to offer the service in that format anymore, but you can, you know, and then at the same time, I think when I first started, there weren't a lot of LinkedIn trainers and now there are a lot of LinkedIn trainers. So I think uber niching has been mm. really important to me too. So talking about the fact that I'm a content marketer, uh, LinkedIn is part of your overall strategy. It's not your sales and marketing plan. So you should separately have a sales and marketing plan linked. And so really being clear about, so clients that come to me that say, I've got an, um, you know, a consultants that might say, I've got an event in six months and I need to get bums on seats. This is prior to COVID, about four or five years ago. I need you to do a campaign with me to get those bums on seats. And uh, my conversation would be, well, where were you 18 months ago? So you can't sort of just get bums on yeah. seats like that. That's not how the world works. So I started to realise that we were really talking to organisations who were already subject matter, so leaders of, who were already subject and small to medium sized organisations, not larger ones. So yeah. I was always talking to the decision maker they understood that this was a slow dance. They valued the concept of business foreplay. They knew that they had to build their brand over time. They knew that that would LinkedIn wasn't a shop front where you, it was a transactional place. It was a place where you built relationships. Yeah. Relationships and, and your role as thought leadership. And so it was in the process of saying no to some clients that we created the space to say yes to a lot of other clients mm. And that means through your referral partners, you also build a bit of a reputation for being, you know, I'm the handholder, I'm the person that helps the Luddite that's anti-social media, I'm the person that helps the office manager that is just being given the job of running the LinkedIn company page, I'm the person that's happy to train, the, you know, digital marketers who aren't going to try and compete with me but want to add LinkedIn into their repertoire and so I'm the go-to for a lot of digital marketers that are sort of more in the Facebook Instagram space and when their clients ask them about LinkedIn they'll point them to me and vice versa mm. so I think it was sort of um, naturally led by clients who we wanted to work with then influenced by clients who we didn't want to work with and then strategic which is really important right and it then is so important yeah Strategic partnership. So you start to develop a name and really, I, while I am a huge advocate of building your online presence, I'm probably a bigger advocate of building um, in real life relationships and referrals and networks because it's that human connection and just getting runs on the board and doing great work is yeah. going to help you build your business. And, and by in real life these days, we, it can be a Zoom conversation. Oh, absolutely. It can but be messaging. But it's not, you don't have to go to networking groups. I haven't been to a networking group. Although at the weekend I did a big mentoring group, which is slightly different, but that was my first in-person event for a year. Over a yeah, year. it's interesting. I'm, I'm coming around a corner of what feeling disconnected and, um, you know, we can, maybe we'll talk about that, but sort of, you know, this idea of how you build community, I'm really exploring at the moment how I do that both from an online and the in real life perspective. I've loved the home office set up and, you know, having this local Quran and getting my washing done while I run my business. I'm ready to be, to do more social interaction though. I mm. used to, I love that so many of my clients have expected, uh, accepted online delivery. It means I'm not flying to Sydney and Brisbane as much. And of course, you know, depending on what's going on in the world, that can be, you know, variable with, locked, mm. you know, snap lockdowns, etc. cetera. Um, but at the same time, there's something very, um, what's the word? It nurtures your creativity being mm. in different environments. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm regional, obviously. So there's not much I can go to. So I'm three and a half, four hours from Melbourne. It's very rare that there's an event that I can go to for a couple of hours of an evening. Yeah. But when it's a weekend, like I went to CopyCon and that was amazing. Um, and then this mentoring weekend, but you don't have, I'm just saying to the, our audience, you don't have to be in a position where you can attend in-person stuff to create relationships with people. Absolutely not. And there's a a whole, no, there's a whole lot of, one of the things that sort of got me through COVID was 
joining a whole lot of uh, women's business communities, yeah. I'm in a number of them that are just fabulous. Mm. And they're, you know, we have Wednesday meditation for one of them. We have Monday coffee catch up for another one. We have Thursday coffee catch up. So you don't go to them every week, but you, you know, Zoom's got really sophisticated with breakouts. And if it's well facilitated, the, the facilitator will ask a really good question. And then you get into a private group and everyone's got their coffee and they're sitting there and, you know, I think there's this generally agreed rule, what happens in the Zoom breakout room stays in the Zoom breakout room. <laughs> and it's been lovely. So mm. I think that's just for me personally, not, um, it's that connectedness. So for people that are remote, it's about sort of getting out and walking down your main street, you know, saying hello to your neighbour, uh, talking to the dog. I have fabulous conversations with my, we've got a, a, a dog that we've had him for the last six weeks, a three and a half year old oh. dog. So whatever social interaction looks like for you, talk <laughs> to your plants. My zucchini plants, well, not my zucchinis this year. What did well? My eggplants have enjoyed a regular, you know, conversation with yeah. me. Yeah, <laughs> I talk to my trees. My trees. Hello, I love trees. a nice tree. Oh, so do I. Mm. That's all. Anyway, right. Well, what are we talking about? <laughs> well, we're not the. I'm sure we're not the only two people that talk to our plants. In fact, I know we're not. So Good. don't Good. feel alone out there. Um, <laughs> if you're losing your mind, uh, how do you manage? Obviously, you've got your two boys. How do you manage your life as an entrepreneur? And, and you know, you had your journey with your mum as well, mm. um, which would be incredibly difficult. It was very hard. Yeah. So outsourcing so I guess um my partner my husband also runs a business and I tell him as a feminist he doesn't know what I mean I'm like the fact that you don't know what I mean makes you beautiful so we really uh I remember early in the early stages of our marriage I just put post-it notes on all the different chores that we did across the house and put them on the put them on the kitchen table and went okay let's choose the things that we really like and so I never put bins out he never changes the doona cover, you know, like just the jobs we hate, we don't do. I did a really similar thing as my children sort of hit 8, 10, 12. So here's all the jobs. Let's choose, you know, what we're all doing. You're all participating in this household. So I don't do sort of pocket money or anything like that. But if you want to go and socialise with your friends, sure, I'll give you 10 bucks towards it. So really it's a very democratic household where we're all chipping in and participating um, and we negotiate our way through each week. Um, and so... I don't take on the, I don't feel like I have to do it all. And I make sure all the people around me and that sort of sentiment is shared by people mm. in the house. So that seems to work. Um, I think just being realistic about how much you can manage to meal planning is great. I've got a Thermomix. It's fantastic. Yeah. I've got boys, you know, Thermomix. When I first came across that thing, I said, does it come with a vibrator? <laughs> Because men are in trouble if it does. I'm just putting it out there. Oh, um, man. It doesn't, just for the record. But the Thermomix is um, I can see some great. promotional opportunities there with different MLMs, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, if you're a real cook and identify and get great pleasure from cooking and don't get a Thermomix, but if you're like me and want to cook nutritious meals but really don't want to stand there staring at it, um, and also my husband's a fabulous cook, so that's good. And I think it's just accepting that some meals need to be assembled, not, you know. You know what my kids had for dinner last night? Breakfast at dinner. And they were oh. like, oh, this is so good, mum. I'm like, yeah. you guys just want bacon and eggs for dinner? And they're like, oh, yeah, so good, mum. Yeah. I did contemplate making pancakes afterwards, but I didn't. I've got a, ther I've got a knockoff thermo mix. Um, is there such a thing? I didn't know that. Yeah, I've got a code in thermo fake. It's been going for seven years. But anyway. Wow. I... Tonight, like, so my kids have dietary stuff, which I've talked about in the past. Hot cross buns, mate. There's no low fod, mate, hot cross buns. Mm. They are like death. So tonight I'm going to make chocolate, low fod, mate, chocolate hot cross buns. But I'll just chuck them in my thermo fake and I know that I'm not going to be kneading for yeah. 45 minutes. And it just opens up for me when I need to do something really easy. Like, all right, I'm just going to chuck a whole lot of veggies and some stock in the, in the, in the thermo. <laughs> And voila, we're having soup for dinner, you know? Yeah, and, it's just, and that's such a winner. And the slow cooker as well. Like, yeah. so you're not in that always reacting kind yeah. of mode. You're in a proactive kind of mode. And I yeah. think that's part of how we can stay organised and on top of things. Because there's so much overwhelm. There's so much demand on our attention. Oh, look, there is. And I figure if I'm having three out of four weeks that are doing well, and I say this to my clients, you know, you're doing three out of four weeks really well, great. And then the fourth week, it, it can all fall apart and that's fine. 
Um, and you know, of course, like we've, um, we, we sort of didn't have the cleaner during COVID and we just had the conversation over the weekend that we're going to engage services of the cleaner again. When I get to the pearly gates, domestic um, standards, high cleaning standards are not going to be something I'm recognised for. <laughs> uh, that's my husband's superpower. And I just had to wait for him to say, oh, look, I really don't want to clean the house anymore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's just the sharing, right? So yeah. I remember I did the children's lunches for years and one year I was getting really busy in my business. I said, look, can you take over doing the, the lunches? Yeah, yeah, sure. After about a year, he said to me, I've done lunches for a year. And I said, that's fantastic. I've done it for seven. <laughs> FYI. And, and, and our kids can get touch up lunch twice a week. They can only have like two things off the menu. And I go, you know what? That's the best fourteen dollars I spend yep. all week. Yeah, and they're like, we get tuck shop once twice a week. I'm like, yeah, yeah mum gets to have a shower before you yeah. leave and start in the office. You know, thirty minutes, forty five minutes. Early. Yeah, which is everything, right? That yeah. thinking time in the morning, and I think it's just accepting in business and in life you can't do it all. And so, what are the things that are worth outsourcing? So, when mum was um, first, you know, we were mapping out what to do, I brought in you know, dementia consultants. And I also had someone who was a sort of a, what was she called? It was, it was like a wife. And I remember saying that to my accountant, I coded something as, uh, it was sort of life services. And she got really confused. My accountant's like, but Karen, I thought you were married. And I'm like, I am married. This is a, this is an outsource. So she got really confused. I said, this is an outsource solution. So she was sort of shopping for me at one stage and, um, like a and then I just got to, there. Yes. Well, not looking after the children, just all the errands. Pardon? Housekeeper? Yeah, I, I think yeah. Um, there's some really interesting stats in Annabelle uh, Crabbe's book about this, that the busier you get and the more sort of senior you get, people, a lot of women, this is the research, start to take on more domestic duties around the house. I don't know why. She doesn't sort of explain why. Mm. And so I think you've just got to catch yourself and say, how, you know, what am I really <laughs> capable of and how much can I do? And what's my standard and what's the actual livable standard? Absolutely. And I don't have high, you know, as long as my children are fed, the, the animals are fed and my plants are fed, I won't notice things like dust. I will definitely, I mean, I, I'm, I like doing washing. I like washing the clothes. I like and I like washing dishes. I don't know why. <laughs> I think because it drowns out my kids. Like. But that's it. That's all the things I enjoy. So the rest, um, I just said to my husband, if it bothers you, you do it. Otherwise, let's get a cleaner. And so that's where we've landed. And I think it's just having conversations with everyone. I mean, I've, I reckon I've definitely had moments where I've, caught myself in the kitchen feeling really frazzled because I had to meet a deadline and I'm, uh, you know, I, I put some sort of stupid pressure on myself to get some meal out. And I might've, and then my boys are, I don't even know what my boys are doing, maybe doing homework or something. And, and you probably, you will over the last six months have heard me call out, this is unrealistic. You guys <laughs> need to come and help. Yeah. <laughs> Why am I doing this by myself? Yeah, I think something like that. And they, they get it. They run out. And I think um, I feel as a mother, I've got the responsibility to create good life partners. Yeah. That my boys really participate and know how to do things. And I would do exactly the same with girls. It's not about their gender. It's just about you have to participate in the yeah. household. And so, and my mother-in-law did such a fabulous job with her three boys. I mean, they just all cook so well and they're, you know, they're house trained. And I, my husband bought the Dyson, has used it a hundred times more than me. Good on him. Yeah. My, my, my husband's used the chainsaw, literally. We're on a property. So it is very much, I can't do the stuff he does. Yeah. I'm too scared of the ride on. I'm too scared of the whipper snipper. And they're bloody heavy. And I'm too scared of the chainsaw. So I'm like, it's all right, honey. You can mow the lawn and I'll do the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the negotiation, right? And that's Fine. what you've got to work out. Whereas I'm the gardener, you know, we just, and that was the post-it note exercise that works yeah. a treat. You just go, what do you actually enjoy doing? And yeah. what are the things you hate? <laughs> I think we both hate mowing the lawn, but. <laughs> you pay someone for that. Oh, uh, no, we, it's, it's way too much here. But oh, anyway. Okay. It's, and I'd love a ride on mower. That would be, I'd so be putting my hand up for that. Our place is really steep and oh, scary. Oh, maybe not because yeah. you can tip. We got four wheeler or three wheeler? Four wheeler, but yeah. my husband was on his brand new. The wheels nearly fell off, nearly killed him. There was a bit of a manufacturing problem. 
Oh my goodness. Yeah. Cause I've heard that they're really, the three wheelers are really dangerous for rolling. Oh, three wheeler. I wouldn't get on out. Cause we're, yeah. we're on a one and five slope bike. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, lawn mowers, they're fun, but um, I only do the flat bit. Right. So what does a great day in the office look like for you? Apparently right on mowing. Well, um, well, there is some. There might be some vegetable gardening in there. So an idea day in the office, I think it's changing for me. So if you had have asked me three months ago, I might have said um, I'd go for a walk with my neighbour, who's also my business confidant. So we walk twice a week. So my day would start like that. We'd solve a few problems of the world, talk about you know feelings that we had around overwhelm, and just you know just a bit of self talk for each other to manage and. We're both a bit maternal towards each other. Now, stop thinking that way and you yeah. need to. No negative self-talk. I've got my yeah, type so it's one really good buddies to for that. Yeah. have that um, as a sounding board twice a week. So no, my day normally starts with some form of exercise and that's a really big deal for me. I, I never used to say that and it, getting that habit into my life didn't habit. start naturally. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my habit starting April. Yes. So I had said that for three years too. And then COVID, it was just a mental health thing. And then I've continued it. So it's either a walk or um, Pilates. We've got a Pilates clinic down here, which is amazing. And then it's really, I have um, very uh, disciplined ways that I approach my work. So I have a, I'm sort of looking at it now in front of me. I map my week hour by hour, everything that I'm doing. I use a HubSpot CRM, which tells me exactly what my tasks are. And to avoid distraction and procrastination, I just follow it. So it will either be a combination of one on a virtual consults, writing someone's LinkedIn profile. So, you know, my happy place is really in my flow doing the work, whether that's a consult or the writing. Um, I will then take regular breaks. So I have a, a um, morning tea and lunch, which I'm, I prepare, you know, healthy snacks because that's such an important part of me staying on when I'm productive. Mm. I'll chat to the dog and your, and your dog. So I love my lunchtime ritual because it's sort of his time to be stimulated. So I'll, you know, throw the ball or do whatever he needs to do. He gets his walk in the afternoons with my children. And then the afternoon again is either, and there's a lot of kind of back to back stuff. So I'm sort of on. Yeah. Um, and I enjoy that. Um, but really, six hours is my limit. So my days are kind of nine till four with some breaks in there. And then by the time my boys walk in the door, I really like to greet them. Depending on what sort of mood they're in, we'll have afternoon tea together. And I'll probably get another sort of hour, maybe an hour of just sort of thinking or planning time. So that tends to be my creative, not on the tools time. I might have pre-recorded a, a I might have registered for a webinar and not watched it so I'll kind of have that on in the background and be starting to think about you know I might be out in my garden or I might be but I'm definitely do that more of that I try to put my tools down at 334 yeah. like really the the work and I like to use that free thinking time because I just find my days as much as I love the work that I do it really is heavy mental lifting mm. And I can really only, I've read somewhere that, you know, this kind of eight hour day, I thought, well, why do I need to work an eight hour day? I run my own show, I bill a consulting rate. I, I can't do eight hours and I want to be present for when my children walk in the and door. It's like when we were in the office, no one really did anything between four and five. Absolutely. I agree. And that's where I just, I've really given myself permission probably for the last six to 12 months to just that time is, you know, a good podcast. It was probably when I tuned into your podcast, a good record, just that kind of feed my creativity because mm. I feel like in business every six months, everything's morphing and you've got to really be thinking about how do I want to show up in my life? How do I want to show up in my business? And that seems to work for me. And I've even started to stop myself from keeping working because it's easy I love what I do right so yeah, the ideal day is starting to sprinkle in if I haven't done that morning exercise I will sometimes book myself a four or four thirty Pilates class so I'm just not like I have to go yeah because I don't want you know you pay for You're your committed. slots yeah. and yeah so um that's sort of my ideal day really and then every it's every I do that four days a week and I try to take Fridays off. I say the try because sometimes I might get booked for a conference or 
and you're not going to say no to that opportunity. No. But then I'll take the next. I'll tr- so, for example, last week I was booked for a conference on the Friday. Yesterday I took the day off and went to NGV Triennial here in Melbourne. Yep. And which you know, is beautiful. Did, oh, it was glorious, and I realised that it was soon going to close down. So I, I looked at my phone at the end of the day, and I'd done. 15,000 steps and walked nearly 10 Ks. No wonder I had blisters on my feet. Glad I caught up with a girlfriend in the city who works, who lives and works in the city. So I really try to build in those creative days because that feeds my creativity to keep the momentum going Mm. and wanting to keep working, if that makes sense. Yeah, and it's it's like soul-nourishing stuff. Absolutely. But it can be work-related. Like this weekend when I was mentoring all weekend was one of the best weekends I've ever had. It was so fun. Wow. Because I was just on and I'm helping people. And, you know, when you, I, I don't know if I'm still not comfortable with the word coaching, but I had a conversation about this at the weekend. It's a dirty word, isn't it? Uh, why, do you, why do you not call yourself coach? But when I'm in that coaching, you're helping your clients expand the vision that they have for their life. And it is so incredibly, like, it's exhilarating. It's fun. And that, yeah. like, be, I can be on. I was on like that for two days straight. And I didn't come home on Monday and fall on a heap. And I was just like, wow, that was amazing. Right, let's go again. So you okay. found your happy place. That's, you need to, that's a lesson to yourself. And, look, of course you can use the word coach. I just think it's tricky. I know, it's a bit icky, isn't it? And I've got a bullshit other term, excuse my language. I like the word thought partner. Um, but everyone's like, that's so wanky. Just, Wanky Karen. Well, we're allowed to swear because this is my podcast. Oh, excuse me. So I've said two things now. <laughs> Please. Oh, I just don't, I say not suitable for children um, and explicit. Um, but it's, and that has only, like me finding that happy place has only happened in the last month. Like when I've actually, like I always knew it was something I really enjoyed, but actually acknowledging it, stepping into it and going, actually, yep, yeah, this is it. This is all I'm going to do from now. But, but that's, I, need- I think that's thrilling. I think that's so it's exciting amazing. for you. It's amazing. But it was a yeah. coach who said to me, why are you doing all this other stuff? Why are you not just doing coaching? And I was like, because I'm playing small. Stop calling well, me. I don't know about this small, big thing. I think we're all ready when we're ready. But uh, you know what's interesting about Sometimes me? it cakes a kick up the butt, though. Yeah, but what's interesting about your, that experience is that it took someone else to identify what you should be doing. And if I think about two major milestones in my business development, it was someone else that said to me, you should be doing this. I didn't decide on my LinkedIn expertise. Someone else said, I don't understand why you don't just do this. Like your knowledge of LinkedIn. And I just sort of went, oh, okay. And then when I got that rating, the expert rating, I was like, that's bullshit. I'm oh, sorry. I've got to stop swearing. That's, that's right. ridiculous. That's ridiculous. <laughs> but that's, you know, I'm, how can I be an expert? I, you know, I'm always learning. And they said, that, Karen, you, someone else has identified you in that way. You have to accept it. You've got, you know, what are the issues behind why you won't accept that? Yeah, why, why so I think it's a good? gift. I think yeah. someone saying that to you is a really nice validation and I don't think it's the small stuff I want to really tackle that because I think it's just the I'm a busy person you talking about you I'm a busy person with a lot on I'm I'm blossoming as a I'm blossoming and this is where I'm you know this is what very hungry caterpillar this is how I look as a butterfly right now (laughs) beautiful butterfly that was my daughter's favorite book that brings me to a a future question but we'll, we'll skip over the question between come back to that Imposter syndrome. So what do you, where do you reckon that comes up and how do you respond to the bad days in business? Because I think for me, playing small is I don't feel ready. I don't feel qualified. I don't feel that I can deliver the outcomes to my clients when I know that I can, but just because your brain tells you something doesn't make it true. So I'm not sure I'm imposter syndrome is something I've ever encountered. And I feel extremely uncomfortable sharing that with you because I know that that is, um, I just feel uncomfortable because I know that that, so I I think the reason is that um, when I was growing up, my parents always said to me, 
my mother in particular, it doesn't matter what your result is. What matters is that you can put your hand on your heart and you can say you've tried your hardest. And I think, so I think there's that factor. And I, so I had a lot of permission to fail. I think mm. I, I, I grew up in an environment where a love of learning and reading and, and challenging people's thoughts and discussion and, and it, to the point where it's quite abrasive. I had to sort of tone it down in the real world when I was a working, you know, working girl. People don't like being challenged. Well, and also just, I did, I think it also cultivated a bit of view of black and white and you've got to be more flexible in your thinking, which is a conversation I have with my 13 year old all the time. So there was that. And then there was also this idea that you can be motivated in two different ways. So you can be motivated by the goal or you can be motivated by the fear of not achieving. Like I, you know, I don't want to miss out on all the potential that the world offers. And I think I'm that second category. So I think because I feel like comparison is so dangerous, I've always just moved to the beat of my own drum. Mm. And that's been difficult at times because like I will see a concept and don't understand why other people can't see it or I make all these sort of connections. So I think I've never really, I've got a really curious brain and I'm a deep thinker and I'm always pulling things apart and putting them back together. So I don't think I've really... I'm not saying I'm not ever going to suffer from imposter syndrome. I just don't think I'm, it really is part of the way I view the world. I just, I'm a lifelong learner, right? So I know I have so much to learn and I know when to submit in situations. Like I know when that it, things just get the better of me. And so when that happens, I just put my learner cap on and inhale a whole lot of information. So I don't really stop and go, <gasps> I'm not, worthy I had more stop and go I don't know how to do this I need to get my head around how to do this and so I would just ask all the people around me and say what do you think what do you think what do you think I'm thinking this what do you think what do you think what do you think I'm not really sure you know how do you do this and I mean maybe that's the imposter syndrome part where I remember when I first started my business and I was thinking about the resume writing and I contacted some recruiters and I and I said what do you think do you think I should do this and and they said well the fact that you've already got clients and you're doing it, yes. And you're don't actually you're already gonna, doing it. Yeah, you're already doing it. Don't think you have to make a full-time business out of it. Don't think you'll be able to make a full-time business out of it because you won't. You'll have to supplement other things and do other things. And I did actually work, I failed to mention this, as I built my consultancy up, I actually worked three days a week training for an organisation in diploma of management, et cetera, because um, I'd done my teach training post the redundancy, I actually went and learnt to become a secondary teacher and then went into teach train went into adult training. So I think at the point at which I hit the I don't know how to do this, I look outwards. Mm. And I'm a really big, I'm a lifelong learner. I'm a really big believer in ask the question. I'm really comfortable with being vulnerable. I'm really comfortable with not knowing. And I'm an inherently private person. So I and I journal a lot. So I, I have, and I've got this sort of walking partner. So I'm regularly sort of, I don't really have any fear I might have is not related to my business. It's related to, am I doing a good job as a mother? You know, navigating, I've got two really different boys and so I've got to parent them really differently. So any self doubt I probably have is more in relation to, am I doing the best job I can possibly do as a parent? And that comes back to my values. I love my work. I love what I do. I feel really confident in my abilities. It just doesn't define me. And I, I play the game. Like I'm very much seen as the, the LinkedIn go-to. And that game is my personal brand. And that's how I choose to show up online. The people who know me know that there, I'm, there are so many other parts to me. Mm. And so I guess that I think for me, imposter syndrome doesn't play out in business because I compartmentalize. Mm. And so this is how I show up when I'm working. This is what I need to get done. And I really feel like my experience with my mother's illness, I just didn't have the chance to have any, I just had no opportunity to experience mm. self-doubt because I needed to be there for her. I needed to play that role. And so it made me very decisive and pragmatic about how I ran my business because I just didn't have time. To worry about what together. other people would think. <laughs> yeah, you're using all your emotional energy to invest in your time with your mother and caring. Absolutely. For your so the business was just there. Yeah, just 
it was just there. See, I'm really bad at compen, comp, whatever, compen compartmentalize. It's the only way I can navigate all the parts of my life. You know, I'm a yeah. sister, I'm a cousin, I'm an aunt. I'm a family is a really important part of who I am. And all of my family will say, you know, we wish we spent more time with you because I work and I do spend time with my family. However, I, I, I just work gets done and then I focus on the other things around me. Yeah. And I think like boundaries. So I'm mm. like, mm. I, I was in a, one of the Facebook groups, the freelance Facebook groups and, and the question went up and said, you know, Easter, are you, are you putting an out of an office on? Are you working? Are you, you know, and I'm like, of course I'm not working. It's Easter. Easter. It's, it's a like break. saying I'm working on Christmas Day. Yeah, I know. Um, and, and I read, I was in another group and, and this lady said, I've only had four days off my business in 20 years. That's just... That is no way to live. Yeah. And it's and not I, a badge yeah. of honour. Overworking is not a badge of honour anymore. Yeah, well, it's a, that's a really interesting point because I remember reading Sheryl Sandberg's book, Oh, this is contentious, what I'm about to say. I'm yeah. saying it. So I remember, you know, the lean in and I get it. And I, I'm not, saw it, I'm not, that was a very flippant comment. Mm. I, I, so there's a point to my story. So I remember her at the start of the book and Cheryl, you know, I've got to really tread very carefully with this, but there was a, a statement that she made in there that said, uh, it's really important to you know work's really important and it's okay if I didn't turn up to some of my children's athletics event and what's important is that adults they see me as a whatever and I just thought no it's really important that I turn up to my children's athletics events and it's really important that I'm there at that moment when they're coming through the line and if leaning in means not turning up as a mother I'm not playing like that's not and so I think I, you just got to create your own rule book mm. as a as anyone in business, and mm. you've got to just basically say, "What are my rules of engagement? What are my boundaries? What am I going to compromise, and what am I not going to compromise?" And for me, attending my children's major sporting events yeah. was a huge thing for me. And I'm I'm not judging Cheryl Sandberg that she decided it was different for her. That's absolutely okay, and I think it's the point that you have to decide how you turn up. And so that compartmentalization for me is I'm the same with holidays. I am ruthless. Mm. And since the day I worked full time and started my first job, the first thing I sit down at the start of every year is work out when all the um, public holidays are. And I build all of our holidays around it. And I get great pleasure from working out our family holidays. And the reason I started working originally post you know, like the reason I went, I'm not going back into full-time work. I'm going to try and cut. I'm going to just see, I'm going to just carve mm. out. I never wanted to run my business. I just wanted a creative, I wanted a lifestyle where I could participate in all areas of my business. And so it's just working out how you want to show up. And, and it's also not comparing yourself. So I think imposter syndrome kicks, kicks in if you've spent, I mean, it's a deep psychology. It's very real yeah. for a lot of people. And I work with clients, men and women who experience it. I think the, if you can just not compare yourself to others and try very hard to run your own race, mm. you will increase your confidence because your benchmark is set by you. And so I'm only ever comparing myself to who I was yesterday. And so the journal helps that, you know, this is what I want for myself. And then yeah. I, you know, I can compare it. And I think also I have extremely strong values. So the other thing, you know, I got brought up in a Christian household. I am a believer. I do not throw that down everyone's throat, even though I identify in that way. I believe in God as a concept, but not the church as an institution. I rarely say that out loud. And you warned me that we're going to talk about things that, you know, <laughs> so, so that is very, on a journey together. Yeah, but that is, we're here. <laughs> that is a really solid part of my makeup. And so I, I have um, a lot of, I just know that I'm not in control and people listening to this who are atheists will sort of be like, oh my gosh, what do you mean you're not in control? I get great comfort from the fact that I know I'm not in control. Mm. Mm. I'm not a, I'm or too am a believer in spirituality as a concept, but not the institution of the church. And I am the, you know, there is a path I'm on where there is something bigger than yeah. us. And, and how does that make you feel? How does that make me feel? The fact that you know that. You know, it's that whole thing, the universe has always got your back. Um, 
it makes me feel assured. Yeah. See, one of my really strong, I don't know if you can call it a value, but one of the, my great things in life is I'm always seeking joy. I'm always trying to find the happiness. Um, and that's something that's only been really strong for me in the last sort of year or so COVID. And then, and I went, you know what, life's too short. And that's what you're talking about. You know, I'm not going to miss my kids major events. My kids aren't sporty particularly, but I'm going to be there for their fellowships when they're up on stage singing their yeah. songs. And that's, you know, and after the last fellowship, because it was the first one we got to go through to for a year, my mum and I went to brunch, that brunch yeah. turned into lunch. And you know I what? Love it. I love it. I wasn't in the office all day. Did yeah. the world fall apart? No. No. Did my business collapse? No. <laughs> and when we go on holiday, I cruise because there's, well, you can get internet, but I avoid it because I'm so, I'm off. Yeah. There is no way you can get in contact with me. And it's so liberating. Yeah. Just being able to switch off and having those boundaries and going, no, yeah. I'm not going to be in the office. Like my out of office is, I'm not going to be in the office. I'll reply to you when I get back. Mm. And unless the world is falling down, everything will be fine. Everything will it be will, fine. Yeah. I used to work in a really high pressure job in corporate um, where stuff would go wrong or when stuff went wrong, it was the end of the world. Tens of thousands of dollars worth. Well, that's, that's serious. But my, um, my boss used to say to me, you know, cause we're all in it together. It was quite, it was a lovely team. Um, did anyone die? No. Mm. You know, let's get some perspective here. Mm. You know, everything's recoverable. Everything's changeable. Human relationships are the things that are actually important. Um, you're not going to lie on your deathbed and go, did I lean in? <laughs> very controversial. Um, but we're not going to just Brene Brown, so it's fine. Um, oh, no. She's one of my favourites. And I, she's, you know, she, yeah, she's a very strong force for me too yeah. and this arena idea you know if you're not in the arena I don't really care what you've got to say yeah and so I'm so maybe that's also why imposter syndrome doesn't kick in because I know who my people in who are in the arena with me and the rest is just noise I'm out and I think yeah. that concept of my arena and my happy place and my I'm not going to use the word tribe has come to me because I turned 40 yeah, don't use tribe. Do you don't know from an Indigenous perspective why that? It's cultural appropriation. Yeah, yeah great, um, great. But my people are, you know, that concept has come to me only, I turned 40 last year and I reckon I turned 40. It was like a flip to switch. Boom, done. I'm out. I'm out of anything that doesn't align with me, my values, yeah. Yeah. what I want to do with my life because I'm done with the people pleasing and I'm done with, I'm sorry, your feelings got a bit hurt, but... <laughs> Here we are. I'm hurting myself if I don't stay in my own alignment. But isn't that liberating? There's something about that 40s, yeah. Because I feel like 35 to 40 was just a blur because of the young children thing. And then as I sort of hit my 40s, I started to sort of really work out who I was. And it's that sort of not needing permission. And, you know, I'd rather ask for forgiveness than ask for permission. That whole kind of vibe came in. So I think it's... And I think, you know... it. It's environmental. So I happened to choose a partner. My mum would say to me, oh, you know, such a, such a, such a lovely man. He's, you know, you're so lucky, Karen. I don't believe in life. I'd say, mum, he's lucky too, you know. Like, <laughs> cats both ways. I married well. And what I don't mean money. I mean a, I mean a, a human, human being who came on this journey with me yeah. in a loving partnership. I mean, we are fiery. We do, we, we're ruthlessly independent. And, you know, really, God help anyone that comes camping with us. It's like, set up your tent before us because we are very funny to watch. And We, we don't speak anymore. <laughs> when we put the tent up, it's just a process. We'll get through it. Just don't talk to each other. My oh. husband reckons he manifested me. Oh, that's beautiful. It's like I went into the room and I said, I'm going to talk to the prettiest girl there. Well, that is so beautiful. <laughs> and there I was. There you were. Oh, it's lovely. So but I think, um, and so I come from a place of, you know, I've, I've had great parents. I do have, still have my darling father who gives me a, you know, fresh flowers from his garden every single week. Aww. And I was taught those simple values that have, have really put me in good stead over time. And I continue to have an extended family that's very supportive, mm. you know, and I think 
that's everything, right? And I acknowledge, you know, one in three of my friends are now divorced. I've got a lot of single parents in my community and I acknowledge it's not easy. And I do act proactively if anyone uses my services and I find out they're a single parent, they get a super discount on my services because I feel like I'm not privileged in a financial sense. I'm privileged in a, you know, environmental family sense. Mm. I've got this strong pack around me. Me too. Um, and that's everything, right? And, you know, we get those random family, you know, non-family members that get invited into our Christmas and into our oh, world. We've got, a, we've got a very, well, my best friend is my mother's favourite daughter. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that beautiful that yeah. you can share that your mum with Because they're my her. core, you know, they're yeah. the core of my yeah. being is this, I've had this incredible privileged beautiful upbringing with two incredible parents they've been married for 46 years i'm so i've still got my grandma oh and you this, are so lucky. i'm so I'm lucky. Lucky. i don't believe in luck i actually believe you're blessed hashtag blessed um <laughs> but i'm also hashtag grateful um and it is it is when you've had that really solid foundation it is you are lucky yeah i put in yeah. the of commas for anyone listening um to have that to always, you know, you're never going to fall far. Yeah. You're always going to be able to pick yourself up. Yeah. You've got that resilience to fall back on. You've got that support network and it doesn't have to be family. It can be friends. Yeah. Well, family can family. be, don't have to be blood relation. And I think also we came off, I was talking about, I went to the NGV with my aunt yesterday and we were having a cup of coffee on the break, you know, just went out in the back garden, back area and having a cup of coffee. And I was saying to her how grateful I was that, we have country relatives. So I used to milk cows at Gunbow and near Echuca and we've got um, family in Weath Valley near West Wyalong that are Merino sheep farmers. And having that experience as a child and going onto the farm and getting on the tractors and, yeah. you know, pulling out little sheep that I didn't want to have. What are the, when they get their, uh, they get their tail. It's yeah, called something. Yeah. You know, pulling That's what my stuff. husband used to do on school holidays. Oh, my gosh. And, and you know, taking my six-month-old first baby up to Wee Valley and him lying on the, on the ground and me having to make breakfast, lunch and dinner for all the shearers, like that experience, having that connection to country, and I don't mean an Indigenous sense, like my family in the country, yeah. was I think it, I've only realised as I get older how incredible that experience was in forming me. Mm. You mm. warned me about this. We're talking about <laughs> things I've never talked about before. You know, that wasn't over a glass of wine without a video and a... <laughs> Sorry, it's just, it's just conversations with Richard Feidler. So let's get back to some easy questions. What are right. your favourite tools that you use oh, to help you be list. productive? Yes, I, list. List. I love a lady with a list. So HubSpot mm. is a CRM. I've tried a couple of CRMs, really happy with HubSpot. So anyone tuning in, there's a free version, which is fabulous. So you can kind of trial it to, before you work out. I don't get any links or anything to HubSpot. LinkedIn. Oh, of course. How oh. I stay connected with my professional community. Trello is how I work in tandem with my LinkedIn profile writer. So we write the profiles together. So it's a sort of a job board that keeps our, us on track because I like to keep things off email because I like the email stuff, client work. Um, what else? Oh, I've written something here. I can't read my own writing. Uh, what have I written? What does that even yes. mean? Um, what would BB stand for? That's interesting. I did this over breakfast this morning. The whiteboard, bit of a fan of the whiteboard. Uh, I don't have Visual prompts white above me. Um, Google Drive. Oh, yeah. And just for interactivity, when we do LinkedIn profiles, it's a bit of an iterative process. So we do the draft update, give the draft version to the client, they can comment, which is great because I kind of get them to share their thoughts via the comments and mm. get a vibe on what they're thinking with the, what we've written. Um, we also use Buffer and Meet Edgar for yep. social media scheduling tools. So people will say to me, oh, you seem to always be online and you post things from your company page and like, Seriously, it's a content marketing strategy. We have a clear, I, I do this once a month. Don't think I'm sitting there every day posting. I mean, I do post live from my profile. So stuff I post from my profile is generally not pre-scheduled. Um, if I'm on leave, of course it is. Um, or I'm not posting at all because LinkedIn now has an out of office message. Actually, I must remember to set that, set that today. 
I'm about to go and leave. So, okay, um, Google set calendar reminder. Yeah, task. the Google message I've got to change. So I did have my little Google email message saying, "Oh, look, I'm really busy leading up to Easter." Yeah. Um, yeah. So HubSpot, I'd say, would be HubSpot and LinkedIn would be my key ones. And I've trialed lots of things. So there's, um, you know, I've trialed Airtable, I've trialed Milanote, um, Asana for a while. So I think it's in with tools in your business it's really finding the ones that work for you i'm a mac user so i am that monkey that loves the mac so i have all the sort of integration of all the mac tools which i really like um and i think that you know the mobile phone would have to be i've got the larger sort of version yeah, as my family a giant phone yeah so the this is a key way that i'm really showing up um yeah i'm just let notice the time and i meant to yes all right. How do you maintain your sense of community? Um, so I'm in a number of female business communities that I've sort of proactively researched and I'm in, and that's fabulous. And then I have an inner circle that I do a mastermind with during COVID. We were catching up for a wine, literally a wine. I don't know. I'm doing that every Thursday. And then my walking partner. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I really, um, yeah, they're the main ways. And I've, I've built a community through my clients. So I have a LinkedIn group and I also have a Facebook group. Oh, fun. Gorgeous. So what are you, what's your why? What keeps you motivated in your business? Well, my personal mission and the company's mission is to help people unlock their potential or reach their full potential. So for me, it's about helping people navigate, whether it's LinkedIn or their career or their business, uh, by really understanding the tools around them that they can then really challenge the boundaries. A lot of what we've talked about today, I feel like people walk into their working life and their business with shoulds. A lot of people have their shoulds on their shoulder. And I really enjoy saying to people, look, all, you know, all bets are off. You set the rules. Can you imagine a world where? And if I can get people thinking with that fresh perspective and breaking the boundaries of maybe some records that have been played to them since they were young children, and I'm not a psych, I'd often send clients off to go and see sites. Um, but if they can really open their mind to the possibilities of the world in front of them based on their skill set and their goals, that is at my absolute happy place. When people read their LinkedIn profile and say, oh my gosh, I look amazing. I'm like, this is you. This is actually You've just never are. been positioned in this light. This is all the things you told me when I interviewed you. This is, this is you. It's just that you don't know how to describe yourself in these terms. And that's just thrilling because when you showcase people properly on LinkedIn, you talked about optimizing your profile. Mm you are enabling them to create bigger opportunities for themselves and to get into, well, not bigger, better conversations with the right fit, whether that be mm. the right clients, the right collaborators, suppliers, referrers, even jobs. And that's thrilling because you're really unlocking what's inside the person by showcasing all their skills in a relevant way. Because it's hard to do that. It's hard to talk about yourself. It is so hard. So what are your tips? for all the smart women in My tips are uh, really, um, if you don't have a journal, buy one. Um, if you don't meditate, start. So really spend sacred time with yourself on a regular basis. Now, if you've got really young children, you've got to lock yourself in that toilet or book in the childcare for, well, if it's even two hours a week, just do it. Just put pepper um, on. Yeah, just, yeah, <laughs> just seriously. We, when I had young children, it was play school. At, I don't think even ABC Kids existed. It was oh. play school at like 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. They, yeah. they were your ticket windows. <laughs> um, and so I think trust yourself, talk to yourself, write in your journal how you're feeling right now, what you're excited about, what you're grateful for, and really uh, try to tune into who you are and what you want for yourself and mm. feel confident saying that out loud to the people around you who have got your back and um, ask for help. These are all the sort of, you know, just, just go inwards. And then once you're sort of getting a sense of who you are, get that trusted circle and, and seek feedback about where you want to go and, and, you know, take risks. So mm. I, uh, my husband and I had this magnet on our fridge for years. The new fridge doesn't take magnets. And it's everything is sweetened by risk. Mm. 
interesting concept. Like Marie Folio, everything's figure outable. Mm. You can get there. Mm. Just might and also, on. what's my other favorite? I think it's behind me. It's uh, Thoreau. Thoreau. Go mm. confidently in the direction of your dreams. Live the life you imagined for yourself. Oh, but you've got to envision it and imagine it. Without the and you, shoulds, without the yeah, shoulds. Yeah, and you need to just, um, I think a really great book I read in the early days was Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he talks about, you know, if you had six months to live, what would you do? And that's kind of the headspace you've got to really get into. I think COVID forced that on a lot of people. Like, wow, the world's changed. But you've really mm. got to, I've always thought that way. And, and that's that kind of just be in your lane, just think about on your lane. You decide what that lane is. Yeah. yeah. Focus on your of, own goals. Yeah. Close confidence that yeah. will really build you up. Awesome. So, Karen, how can everyone find out more about you and your work? Well, pl- uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. So okay. you'll find That's me, under, I'm sure, in other. the show notes. You'll yeah, I'll put that. in the show notes. And then Think Bespoke is, you'll find me on Instagram. So, at Think bespoke um also our website a website so the website i'm a library lover and a book lover so the website is built a lot like a library so there's a the blog has got heaps of resources there so think bespoke.com.au whatever questions people have about linkedin i've probably answered uh, and so people can access that library there um yeah so they're the two main ways linkedin and uh, instagram and the website awesome thank you so much for your time and your incredible insights today i've loved it thank you so much i could chat to you all day (laughs) thanks karen so i look forward to meeting you in real life yeah irl one day because you are in melbourne so thank you so much